Chapter 6 is over infection. Microbiology is a study of microorganisms or microbes. These are very small living things that are only visible under a microscope. This includes bacteria, fungi, um, protozoa, and viruses. The term non-pathogenic means that they don't cause disease. These are usually beneficial. They're normally part of the body's like normal flora or good bacteria. Pathogens are the disease-causing microbes or germs. An infection results from pathogens invading the body and multiplying, which damages the body. There are various types of microorganisms, like I said, um, and you know how, how they're classified and all of that, and we'll go over it a little bit. Your book goes into detail about these bacteria cells. You do have other classes that go over this, but for this class, I just want you to have a basic understanding. So bacteria don't need a living tissue to survive. They are prokaryotes, which means that they lack a nuclear membrane. They duplicate by binary fission, um, which has an, there's an illustration of this in your book. Their replication time depends on their particular microbe, and they vary in size and shape. Bacteria are grouped based on their cellular shape. So bacilli are rod-shaped, spirochetes are spiral-shaped, cocci are sphere-shaped, and then we also have diplococci, which are pairs, streptococci, which are chains, staphylococci, which are irregular, like kind of like a cluster of grapes. And there are more, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on. Again, these are there are illustrations of these in your book. It gives you a visual of what the different types of bacteria look like. Several types of bacteria can form spores. They're dormant or latent, and what I mean by that is that they're kind of like asleep. So they're just kind of hanging out, not doing anything, but they can be activated at any time. They can live for a long time in that spore state, and they're very resistant to heat and disinfectants. Spores do not reproduce, so they live in that spore state, and they can be returned to the vegetative state where they can reproduce and cause problems in the body. Viruses are not the same as bacteria. When we talk about infections, there's either a bacterial infection or a viral infection, and they're treated differently. Viruses are small parasites that do need a living host to replicate. This doesn't mean that you can't get a virus unless you're in contact with a living host. A virus can live on surfaces or sometimes in the air. Um, it just doesn't replicate there. The amount of time a virus can live away from a living host depends, depends on the virus itself. A virus has a protein coat or a capsid and a core of either DNA or RNA, and this is how they're classified. This is an illustration of different shapes of the viruses. When a virus infects a person, it attaches to a host cell and the viral genetic material enters the cell and the viral DNA or RNA takes control of that cell. So it replicates by using a host cell to produce and assemble its components. It uses the host cell to synthesize, uh, then destroys the host cell, this is called lysis, and a new virus infects the nearby cells. Some viruses are in the latent stage, which means that they exist, but they're not yet developed. Think like they're hidden. They enter the host cell and they replicate slowly or not at all until later. This can cause an immune response by the body, like when we give a vaccine. Sometimes that virus mutates during replication, like the cold or the flu, and creates different strains. This makes it hard to treat viruses with vaccines or antibodies, but we still try. Um, this is why if you get a flu vaccine, you can still get the flu, etc. If a person's immune system is depressed, a virus can't, um, can reproduce very quickly. So if a person has a weakened immune system, like in a transplant patient or cancer patient or HIV patient, etc., we have to be very careful about exposing them to viruses. Or if someone has a virus like herpes and they get a cold, they might have a flare-up of the virus because their immune system is compromised. These three groups of microorganisms are similar to both bacteria and viruses. They're classified as bacteria, but they do require a living host for reproduction. Chlamydia is a common STD that causes PID or pelvic inflammatory disease. It can result in sterility or infertility, infertility in women. And if mom has chlamydia, her infant can actually develop different eye infections or pneumonia because of it. 
Rickettsia are gram-negative bacteria that live in a host cell. They're transmitted by insects like lice and ticks, and they cause diseases like typhus fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And mycoplasmas are a common cause of pneumonia. They don't have a cell wall, so they aren't affected by a lot of different antimicrobial drugs. Then we have fungi. Fungi have a nucleus, that means they are eukaryotic. They're found everywhere, like on animals, plants, humans, food. Fungal growth is promoted by warmth and moisture. Fungus loves warm, dark, moist areas. There are good fungi, like in yogurt and other foods, and bad fungi, like in yeasty infections. Only a few types of fungi are pathogenic. Remember that pathogenic means infection causing. They cause an infection on the skin or on mucous membranes, but they can spread systemically. <clears throat> Histoplasma is a fungus that causes a lung infection. <clears throat> it can cause neurologic disease. It can be transmitted to the embryo or the, or the fetus if mom is infected. Tinea pedis is athlete's foot, but um, it infects the superficial layers of the skin. Candida is usually harmless, but can cause infections in the mouth. We call that thrush, or in the vagina, we typically just call that a yeast infection. Pneumocystitis gyrovecchi causes pneumonia, but has some characteristics of fungi and some of protozoa as well. This is an illustration of what candida looks like underneath a microscope. An oral candidiasis, this is that thrush that looks like, um, this is what it looks like in the mouth. Then we have protozoa. Protozoa are more complex. They're eukaryotes, so they have a nucleus. They're unicellular, they lack a cell wall. They can live independently or on dead organic matter or as parasites or on or in another living host. The pathogens or infection causing ones are usually parasites. Some examples are trichomoniasis, which is a sexually transmitted infection, malaria, and amoebic dysentery. Um, this is like a severe form of diarrhea. This is what or trichomonas looks like. Then we have helminths. These are other agents of diseases. Um, these are roundworms or flatworms. They're not microorganisms, but they're parasites. They're divided into subgroups depending on their characteristics. The life cycle has three stages, the ovum or egg, and then the larva, and then the adult. The ova and larva can be ingested in contaminated food and water, or can enter through the skin or be transmitted by infected insects. They're usually found in the intestines, but they can be in the lungs or blood vessels. Um, they're usually diagnosed by finding them in the stool. This is a pinworm under a microscope a tapeworm under a microscope. We see pinworms, hookworms, tapeworms, and ascaris. These are giant roundworms. Large numbers can cause systemic problems like severe anemia. Prions, these are like protein agents that are transmitted by consuming contaminated tissues like muscle, which is just meat, or using donor tissues that are contaminated. They can cause degenerative disease of the nervous system. So back to that term resident flora that I was talking about. These are microorganisms that are present in the body on the skin, nasal cavity, mouth, gut, vagina, urethra. These are your normal flora of the body. An infection happens when a microbe or parasite is able to reproduce in the body's tissues. They can occur sporadically, which is like in a single individual. They can be endemic, which is in a small area. Epidemic, which is a, just a higher than expected transmission in an area, or pandemic, which is worldwide. Transmission of infectious agents from one person to another is a chain of events. The reservoir is the source of infection. This is the person with symptoms or someone that's asymptomatic like a carrier or a contaminated animal, water, food, soil, or equipment. Um, again, a carrier is someone that might never develop the disease but still carries it. So if I'm in a COVID patient's room with no protective equipment on and I think I'm fine because I'm vaccinated, then I go in a non-COVID patient's room, I can carry COVID to them. A carrier can also have the disease but have subclinical signs, which means that they don't have or show signs and symptoms, but they still you know, have the disease. So to transmit an infectious disease, the agent, which is the microbe that causes the infection, links to the reservoir, which is a person, animal, or environmental source. 
then the agent leaves the reservoir by a portal of exit, like a cough or whatever, and the mode of transmission, air, water, direct contact, food, or whatever, takes the agent to a new host. The agent accesses the new host by the portal of entry, like inhaling contaminated air, touching contaminated surfaces, um, eating contaminated food, etc. Not everyone will get a disease that they're exposed to. We talk about susceptibility here. Some people are more susceptible or prone to getting diseases than others. This depends on health status, immune status, age, nutrition status. So this is kind of like that transmission of infectious agents, a good visual here. So we talked about modes of transmission. This is how it can be transmitted from one person to another. It can be transmitted through direct contact, like touching an infectious lesion, sexual intercourse in bodily fluids. It can be transmitted through indirect contact, like food or linen that someone infected um, and now you touched it. Droplet transmission, this is when you inhale something, like if an infected person coughs and you're near them. Aerosol, or you might have heard of airborne transmission, is small particles from the respiratory tract that can travel further than droplets. They're also suspended in the air for longer periods of time than droplets are. Um, and then vector-borne is when an insect or animal is, in an, is an intermediary host, like in malaria. Then we have nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections happen in healthcare facilities. They happen because many, many microorganisms are present in these facilities along with patients that have infectious diseases, possible contamination on equipment, immunocompromised patients, the chain of transmission through staff, food trays, and more. I mentioned earlier going into a COVID room with no protective equipment and then going into another patient's room and transmitting COVID to them. Stuff like this happens all the time. So these are nosocomial infections. You might also hear these termed healthcare associated or healthcare acquired infections. A healthy person is pretty resistant to infection. Some things that decrease resistance are age, our infants and elderly specifically are more susceptible. Um, genetic susceptibility, some diseases are more common in men than women and vice versa. Immunodeficiency of any type, malnutrition, chronic disease, severe stress, both physical and emotional, inflammation or trauma that infects, uh, or affects the integrity of the skin, impaired inflammatory responses like in steroid usage, and environmental issues like homelessness, poor nutrition, inadequate hygiene, etc. Pathogenicity is the ability of microbes to cause a disease. Virulence is the degree of pathogenicity of a microbe based on invasive qualities which allow it to directly damage host cells and tissues and spread. Toxic qualities which damage host cells or interfere with a host's function. Adherence to tissues causing infections at specific areas of the body and the ability to avoid host defenses. There are new superbugs, which are microbes that can cause serious illness in healthy individuals or don't respond to any drugs. There's a new unique set of signs and symptoms and an increased spread. We're seeing this with COVID, right? One of these super bugs we talk about is MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. There are ways to prevent transmission of infections. Standard or universal precautions are what we do with every patient. This includes wearing gloves, washing hands, then we use specific precautions for patients that have particular infections. We determine these precautions based on the transmission of the infection. In the hospital, you'll most often see contact precautions, which is gloves and a gown, if the infection can be transmitted by contact, droplet precautions, which is gown, gloves, and mask and face shield, if the infection can be transmitted by droplets, and airborne precautions, which is gown, gloves, and an N95 mask and face shield, if the infection can be transmitted um, through those air suspended particles. This is in your book. It demonstrates the infection cycle and breaking the chain of infection. So in order to break the cycle of infection, we have to locate or remove the, or isolate the reservoir of infection. So remember that reservoir is a source of infection. Identify and restrict access to the contaminated food or water. Reduce contact between infected people and the rest of the population, like quarantine, stay home if you're sick, right? 
block the portals of exit where we would have blood, saliva, or urine, and then entry, which is like mucous membranes, blood, or inhalation. So you can do this by wearing masks, covering breaks in skin, etc. Remove or block modes of transmission. So use the precautions that we just talked about. Reduce host susceptibility, immunizations, adequate nutrition and hygiene, access to health care, etc. You can also uh, make sure that we adequately clean surroundings and clothes. Um, so aside from wearing protective equipment you, or protective gear um, like gowns and everything, you should be taking your uniform home and washing it, etc., before you, you know, put it on again. Same with your shoes, whatever. Um, sterilization, disinfectants, and antiseptics. Um, we should be cleaning all of our equipment and supplies before we bring them from one patient to another. I don't know how many times I see vitals machines that, you know, we go in and we use it. With with a patient and then we don't come back out and clean it before we use it again um, again we never know what someone has um, sometimes we do know what they have and we're more likely to clean it then but we should be taking re these regular precautions to to clean um, on a regular basis so we can sterilize equipment by chemicals. We can heat them in an autoclave, but we're probably not going to do that unless you're in a surgical area. So we're going to use different chemicals um, like the wipes or whatever to, to sterilize them. But just know that equipment needs to be cleaned before we sterilize it. If we don't clean off like the gunky parts and stuff like that, then it's not going to become sterile um, once we try to sterilize it. So we need to be making sure that any visible um, stuff is cleaned off before we put it and do any sort of sterilization. Um, we can also use chemicals, like I said, um, antiseptics and disinfectants, you should know the difference between these two. So antiseptics are on the skin and living tissues. This is like your hand sanitizer or anything like that. Disinfectants are on surfaces. So these are like the purple wipes that you'll see in the facilities um, that we clean surfaces with. Disinfectants, we actually usually need to wear gloves in order to use those. So how does infection work? Infectious agents can be present in the body for a while before any symptoms are noticed. This is called the incubation period. The prodromal period is when the infected person starts to feel fatigued. Maybe they have a, a general loss of appetite or a headache. This is kind of when they feel like they're starting to get sick. They just have that malaise or blah feeling. Most of us can can kind of point out like, oh, I think I'm gonna, I'm th I think I'm starting to get sick. They don't have those specific symptoms yet, um, but they just kind of feel that blah. Then the acute period, this is when infection develops fully and the signs and symptoms reach their peak. So make sure you know those three periods. Um, so local infections, these enter the body and remain confined in a specific, specific locations. Um, think of this as like, um, you know, an infection in a wound on the arm. It's just in that one specific spot. Focal infections spread from a local infection to other tissues, and then systemic infections spread to several sites and tissues throughout the circulatory system. So emia means in the blood. So septicemia is caused by the multiplication of pathogens in the blood. This is the cause of sepsis. Bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in the blood. Toxemia is the presence of toxins in the blood. And viremia is the presence of virus in the blood. Mis mixed infections are when several infectious agents concurrently develop at the same at the same site. Acute infections come on rapidly with severe symptoms, but they're short lived. And chronic infections are less severe, but they hang out for a longer period of time. Primary infections are an initial infection followed by complications caused by another microbe. Secondary infections are other microbes that follow the primary infection and subclinical infections don't cause signs or symptoms. So some signs and symptoms of infection, local, so again, that means at the site of infection, so that, that you know, infection in the arm, let's go back to that. So pain, swelling, redness, and warmth. If it's a bacterial infection, there may be a purulent or pus exudate. If it's a viral infection, there might be a serous or clear exudate. So again, local versus systemic, you should know the difference. Systemic signs of inflammation are system-wide, so maybe a fever. The person might be fatigued or weak. Um, they might have a headache and they might be nauseous. 
So how do we diagnose infection? We take cultures, this is collecting a specimen, this could be urine, blood, sputum, etc. And we examine it to find the infectious organisms. Then we do a sensitivity. This is using different drugs with the culture to, de to determine which drugs the infectious organism will respond to for treatment. We say that we're going to culture and check sensitivity if indicated. So there's, if there's infectious organisms, we check sensitivity versus just that culture. We do blood tests to help determine infections as well. Leukocytes, which is an in, or leukocytosis, which is an increase in white blood cells, indicates that there's a bacterial infection. And leukopenia, which is a reduction of leukocytes in the blood, indicates that there's a viral infection. We also check antibodies to determine the course of the infection. We don't use drugs to treat every infection. Lots of people go to their doctor and expect an antibiotic and they're upset if they don't you know, receive one. If we prescribed antibiotics continuously, infections would mutate and become resistant to them. This would be like creating more superbugs. When we do prescribe drugs, they have to be taken at regular, evenly spaced intervals. So if a medication is ordered for every eight hours, it has to be taken exactly every eight hours in order to keep a constant level of it in the body versus taking it with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, they should also be taken until the whole prescribed amount is gone. People start to feel better and stop taking their meds, but they haven't completely killed off the infection, so it can come back. Antibiotics are to treat bacterial infections. They do this a few different ways. They can interfere with cell wall synthesis. They can also increase the permeability of the bacterial cell membrane. They can interfere with protein synthesis and cell reproduction, and they can interfere with the synthesis of essential metabolites. Antivirals treat viral infections. They do this by blocking entry into the host cells, inhibiting the gene expression, or inhibiting assembly of the virus. <clears throat> Antifungals treat fungal infections by interfering with the mitosis of the fungi or increasing fungal membrane permeability. Um, they're usually topical or applied to the skin or mucous membranes. Fungi are toxic, so treating them requires strict medical supervision. And antiprotozoal agents treat protozoa infections. And that's it for this chapter.